Strange, we all right? Be back, Yara. Hey, what was that? Going forward in time. To view alternate futures. To see all the possible outcomes of the coming conflict. How many did you see? 14,605. How many did we win? One. So, there's only one possible means for the salvation of mankind. One possible mean. Bethlehem happened so that Calvary could happen. Christmas happened so that the cross could happen. Without Christmas, there would be no cross. And without the cross and resurrection, there would be no Christmas. So while there was a lot of amazing things that Jesus said and did in between uh, the cradle and the cross, the resurrection, um, those are the bookends that really help us understand what God is doing and what we would think about what Christmas is all about. Because God came into the world, there's only one possible means for the salvation of mankind. If God could have done it another way, he would have. So I don't know that God in eternity past considered all possible uh, outcomes and futures and what's the only possible one. Uh, But if it could have been done another way, I'm sure God would have done it. So the salvation that you and I need could only be accomplished by Jesus coming into this world and being born as a baby, living as a man and dying on a cross and raising from the dead. I am convinced that if it could have happened another way, it would have happened another way. So today we're going to dig a little bit deeper into uh, why God showed up. Last week we considered when God showed up and what we saw was most people missed him. When God showed up, most people missed him, even though there were breadcrumbs through the centuries as a trail that God had left. Prophecies, they're usually called, uh, from Genesis all through the what we call the Old Testament, the Jewish scriptures. He had left signs pointing in that direction, and a prophecy is God promising to do something in the future so that when it happened, we could look back and say, oh, this is what God was talking about all along. And Jesus fulfilled those prophecies. And even though he fulfilled those prophecies, people that were looking for the Messiah, that were familiar with those prophecies, still missed the boat, so to speak. And so it's when they, many of them, begin to look back into their Jewish history and to begin to see those, that people begin to get a little bit more excited about the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament scriptures. But it took a resurrection for that to happen. So today we're going to look at a passage of Scripture that's not probably on your radar screen about Christmas. If you're reading Scripture at home about Christmas, you probably didn't pick this one to read about, but I think uh, it'll go on to your Christmas reading list after this. And it's in Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2 is... uh, uh, a document written by an, an unknown author. The author is never identified. It's the only New Testament document that's not identified uh, uh, as to who wrote it. We really don't know who wrote it, uh, but it was preserved by the early church uh, for us because of what it contains. And it's really talking about, if you read through uh, Hebrews, it's talking about the superiority of Jesus. Chapter 1 is, uh, is all about the superiority of Jesus over angels or any kind of message that God has sent in the past. And it starts off by saying, God who spoke to our fathers in, in times past through the prophets uh, has now spoken to us through His Son. So right off the bat, he's uh, saying that God has spoken. God has uh, sent a message to us, and it's through his son, Jesus Christ. And then in in chapter 2 of Hebrews is where we're going to pick up, and we're going to try to make it all the way through Hebrews chapter 2 today. And I'm going to give you a kind of a a cursory outline of that as we make our way through it. There's really eight or nine words that I'm going to give you. They all begin with S. Uh, to make it easier to remember. And if you're taking notes, you would I hope you would write these words, words down. Or these are the notes, these are the words that you would want to write down. And the first one is salvation. And salvation, verses 1 through 4. Let me read it. I'm reading from the New American Standard because I believe that in this case it is the most accurate to the original text. So salvation, Hebrews 2, 1 through 4. For this reason... 
For this reason, because Jesus is superior. That's, that's pointing back to chapter 1. For this reason, we must pay closer attention to what we've heard so that we don't drift away from it. For if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable and every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty. Now look at verse 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? After it was first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard, God also testifying with them both by signs and wonders and by various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit according to His will. So God has spoken. God has announced. God has announced. And He brought about that announcement, uh, the birth announcement of His Son, Jesus Christ. So the author, as I said, is comparing the Old Covenant, what we call the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, with the New Covenant instituted by Jesus. If you recall, at, his, uh, at the Last Supper, Jesus said, this is the New Covenant, which is the new arrangement in my blood. We're no longer going to look to the blood of bulls and goats. We're looking to uh, my blood that was shed. Uh, and this is the new arrangement that God has with uh, relating to people. And I was thinking about this. You know, Tony the Tiger is that uh, sugar frosted flakes are not just good. They're great. And, and that's what the author is saying about this salvation that God has made known. It's not just good. It's great. It's awesome. It's amazing. It's wonderful. And that word salvation and its various forms used in the New Testament, save, saved, salvation, all same basic root word. And you don't need to know what it is because you won't remember it probably anyway. Um, but it's the word sozo. It sounds like sozo, salvation. And it means to rescue. And as we saw last week, a part of that rescue, that salvation, is to be made whole, to be made complete, so that we don't live life with the feeling that something is missing, that we've missed out. A lot of people have a midlife crisis because at, at a point in their life that they look and see how many years they have left as compared to how many they've lived, and they do the math, and they think, well, in, in, the, in the actuary tables, I probably have less years to live than I do that I've lived, and I haven't accomplished. I, I've missed out. I've missed out. Something's missing. And, and, and that can be a good realization because what really is missing is not an experience, not an event, not a new Corvette, and, and not a new motorcycle, and not a new outfit or uh, clothing line. It, it's what's missing and what makes us whole and complete is Jesus. Jesus. And that's part of this great salvation. And, and we're encouraged to pay careful attention to it unless we drift away. If you're not anchored, if you're out in the ocean and you're not anchored, you will drift. It doesn't even have to be in the ocean. It could be in Buckeye Ocean. If you're not anchored, you will drift. The winds and the currents will take you uh, places that you don't want to go. And so we have to be careful. We have to pay careful attention and we have to stay anchored. Uh, and there's, you know, there's a lot of confusion when it comes to this thing called salvation. I asked my dad once, shortly after I became a Christian and started following Christ, and, and, and I asked him, uh, Dad, have you ever been saved? And he said, yeah, when I was in World War II and the bullets were flying all around me, I called out to the Lord to save me from that battle, and I'm here I am, you know. And, and he did, and I remember thinking, that's not exactly. I mean, I'm glad you lived because, you know, I wouldn't be here if you hadn't. I am a boomer, by the way. You know, anyway, uh, tail end of the boomers, and 57 is my birth date. But uh, you know, I'm glad. I'm, I'm glad he was saved from that. And we just think of the way we use the word "saved." Uh, we save our money. Well, maybe most of us, some of us, might do that or, or not. Uh, we save ourselves for marriage, or not. We save time by taking a shortcut. We save or rescue the cute little kitty or puppy that shows up uh, in our neighborhood on our porch. And uh, we weren't intending to adopt, but we did. We, we save by using coupons. We save money. Jesus spoke about being saved many, many times throughout the Gospels. Just read for yourself. Paul wrote about salvation. Really, the book of uh, Romans, what we call the book of Romans as a letter, is a document, a fascinating, detailed document about salvation. 
Uh, and and he's, he wrote, whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And so other New Testament authors, of the contributors to our documents, they talked about salvation. They talked about being saved. It is the major theme of the entire, what we call, all 66 documents of our Bibles. And, and, and yet there's still so much confusion as to what it means and, and how it comes about. There's probably more confusion within churches as to how it happens as to what it really is. Um, basically, salvation is from sin. It's from sin. It's from sin and its consequences. Its consequences both now in, in this life and its consequences uh, for all eternity. It includes forgiveness, uh, but it is much more than forgiveness. And as we've said, it includes that fullness and wholeness that we have in Christ. It is rescue and it is restoration. Back in May, you may recall, uh, me and uh, Tim and three of our buddies spent some time in the Atlantic Ocean when our boat capsized that we were fishing from. And uh, in 90 minutes, we figured out from the rescue call that, we, that was made by the captain of the ship until the time that our rescue arrived, we were in the water for 90 minutes. And it was the longest 90 minutes of my life. And during that 90 minutes, I prayed for rescue, as did my companions. We were all uh, praying and watching on the horizon of the water, you know, looking for anything that was coming our direction. We were six miles offshore and not another vessel in sight. And then I heard it, the, <laughs> the whirl of a helicopter. And I looked in the direction that it was coming, and I thought, my, my instant response was, cool, I get to ride in a helicopter. I, I just pictured the basket coming down and getting in the basket and being lifted up and taken back to shore. And I've never been in a helicopter. And I thought, man, that would be awesome. And it would be free because you don't have to pay for that kind of helicopter, right? So, uh, and then it was just a matter of seconds, less than it took time for me to say this, that I looked on the horizon of the water and there was the, uh, the, the Coast Guard vessel uh, coming through the water on its way. And I immediately went, bummer. Because I knew what that meant. Now, isn't that crazy? I was about to be rescued. Salvation was coming. And I'm disappointed because I didn't like the way it was coming. And it was, that, that lasted just a few seconds. Just a few seconds. The boat came and got us. And, and obviously... Uh, is the end of the story is, is a good story. But I, I've, I've thought about that this week. I spent some time wondering about it in preparation for this message. What if I'd gotten into the ship? I don't know if it was big enough to be a ship. The boat, the vessel. What if I'd gotten into the floating vehicle and expressed my disappointment <laughs> to these Coast Guard servicemen who... You know, that they rushed to get to us. They, in some ways, you could say, it was kind of a rougher seas. They, they might have been risking their life. I don't know. They, they, they spent, took their time, and they were doing their duty and doing their job, and they rescued us. And what if I had treated them like, why did you guys show up? I wanted, to, I wanted the helicopter, you know? What if I'd been ungrateful like that? What if I refused to get into the boat? I said, nope. I'm holding out for the helicopter. Well, what if I, what if I would have refused that altogether? And then what if what if I refused and they said, "Okay, this is it. This is your one chance." But would they have jumped in and wrestled me and and pulled me in? I kind of think they would have because they would have thought I was delirious. And, and but but what if I would have just ignored? What if I'd ignored the salvation that had come to me? What if I decided, eh, you know, I can make it on my own. It's only six miles to shore with this very flimsy child-sized life jacket that I had on in the higher in waves and wind. What if I had tried to make it on my own? Would I, would I be here today? Well, what if I had ignored and not paid attention to the salvation, if you will, the rescue that came my way? So perhaps you heard the story about the guy who woke up one morning 
and his house was being engulfed in a flood. And he climbed, was able to climb out on his roof, and he began to pray to the Lord for rescue. And pretty soon a little uh, John boat came by, some neighbors and a little small fishing boat, and said, hey, hop in. He said, no, you know, I, I, I've prayed, and, and, and the Lord said he was going to rescue me. He said, okay. So a little bit later, uh, a fire rescue vehicle come by with firemen, and they offer him the same rescue. And he says, no, 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 I'm, I'm waiting on the Lord. And a little bit later on, a helicopter comes by and they start to lower down the rope. And with the bullhorn, they call out to him and says, you know, uh, strap yourself in there. And he said, no, 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 I'm waiting on the Lord. And then the floodwaters come up and and he dies. And in heaven, he says, Lord, what happened? I was waiting on you. And he says, well, I sent two boats and a helicopter. What more do you want? The rescue. Christmas is a rescue mission. It's the beginning of a 33-year rescue mission. And it came in a very unlikely manner. A baby. Flesh and blood. A baby that was born to peasants. They had, there was no room in the inn, but they didn't have money for the inn in all likelihood. And his first crib was a manger full of straw. I'm assuming they put fresh straw in that one. And the most unlikely of manners. But it was exactly what God said was going to happen. He would be Emmanuel, God with us. A virgin would give birth to a child and he will be called Emmanuel. God has sent his son as the savior of the world. What more could we want? How could anybody escape if there's just one way? And there is. Because if there had been another way, God would have gone down that path. If there is just one way, how can we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? So the first word for taking notes is salvation. The second one is son of man. Son of man. Not just a word, three words there. Verses 5 through 8. Jesus often called himself the son of man. So look at Hebrews 2, verse 5. For he did not subject to angels the world to come. Talking about God didn't subject the world to come to angels, concerning which we are speaking. But one has testified somewhere saying, What is man that you remember him? Or the son of man that you are concerned about him? You made him, that is the son of man, for a little while lower than the angels. So Jesus called himself the Son of Man. Here's a couple of examples. Matthew 8, 20. Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Uh, Matthew 9, 6. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So obviously he's referred to called the Son of God, uh, his deity and the Son of Man, his humanity. And it's just the combining of those two into the one, the, the humanness of Jesus Christ. And then there's the next word, supremacy. Supremacy. Starting at verse 7, middle of verse 7, you have crowned him with glory and honor and have appointed him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in subjecting all things to him, uh, he left nothing that is not subject to him, but now we do not yet see all things subjected to him. The supremacy of Jesus Christ, the ruler of, of heaven and earth. We're going to consider uh, the, the, the crown in, in a couple of more weeks. This, this, this is the second uh, in a series called From the Cradle to the Cross to the Crown. And we're really talking about to the cross uh, today. Last week was focusing a little bit more on the cradle. Uh, this week on the cross. But look at what it's saying, that Jesus is, all things are subject to him. That means he rules over all things. One day, the scripture says, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Even those who've refused in this life, even those who've admit, uh, missed, ignored, uh, denied, uh, will one day confess 
that Jesus is indeed Lord of lords and King of all kings. And we'll explore that a little bit later. But Paul wrote in Ephesians 1, verses 21 and 22, talking about Jesus who is far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God has placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church. So Jesus Christ is indeed Lord. The question is, is he Lord of your life? Um, Suffering and substitute, verses 9 and 10. Suffering and substitute. Um, But we do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus. Because of the suffering of death, he was crowned with glory and honor. So that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things and through whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. Now, isn't it amazing? Jesus, the everlasting God, was crowned with glory and honor in heaven forever and ever, temporarily left that glory aside and was made like us, made like one of us. And then it's almost like it's saying that in order to regain that glory and honor, he had to regain it through the suffering of death. What kind of king would give up his glory and suffer the way that Jesus suffered? Only a king that loves his subjects, loves his creation. You know, you realize this, you know this to be true, that much, if not all, the suffering that's in the world really is caused because of sin. Now, I'm not saying that if you're suffering with an illness, it's because you've sinned and therefore God is punishing you. I do not mean that by any means. But the abuse, the neglect, the things that happen to people, uh, we experience the consequences of our own sinful choices, do we not? We also experience the consequences of the sinful choices, the mistakes of, of others as well, don't we? And and Jesus experienced all of that, the suffering of death. He experienced uh, all of my suffering and all of the suffering that I've created. He experienced all of your suffering and all of the suffering that you've created. He's experienced the suffering of of, of all mankind and and the suffering that all mankind has created for others, that was all compacted into the body of Jesus. It's rather amazing. Look at what it says. Because of the suffering of death, he was crowned uh, with glory and honor. His physical suffering alone is unimaginable. I know people that will not watch the Mel Gibson depiction of uh, you know, the, the movie with of Christ's crucifixion because it... Most other movies kind of sanitize the cross. You know, a few, a, a few marks, a few, and it's it's with, understandably, uh, it's gory. It's a gory glory, and that's just the physical part of it. We we, we cannot even begin to imagine the physical suffering, but I, I, I'm convinced that the spiritual suffering was far greater, far greater. As far as the physical suffering, it says Jesus was like a lamb that was silent before his shearers. But when it came to the spiritual suffering, what is it that Jesus uttered? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you forsaken me? When he became the offering for the sin of mankind, when the entire weight of the sin of the entire world was placed on his body, in him, he suffered immeasurably beyond our comprehension. And he he took the sin of the world, and in those three hours that he's on the cross, he experienced the combined power of the suffering. I'm convinced that he experienced the equivalent of hell for each of us in that time on the cross. Unimaginable. Unimaginable. The weight of the world, the sin of the world, placed 
on him. But his suffering on our behalf, look at what it says, crowns him with glory and honor. The Father in heaven uh, put that crown back on his son uh, with glory and honor. It further displays his glory and honor. Jesus tasted, look at what it says, He tasted death. He tasted death. So we wouldn't have to. No, there's two kinds of death that's talked about in Scripture. One is physical death. One is you breathe your last, your heart beats its last, your brain waves stop waving, and you die. Death. And then there's a second death. That Revelation talks about a second death. Death in reality is a separation when our spirit or our soul uh, leaves our body at, 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 at our physical death. That's the first death. And, and we all experience that. Then there's a second death, which is a separation from God. When Adam and Eve ate from the tree in the Garden of Eden, and God had said, in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. They did not drop over dead with a heart attack. They continued their physical life. But they lost something on that day. They lost the presence of God. And the story of mankind is pretty much gone downhill since that point in time until the rescue mission that Jesus has initiated through Christmas and the cross. So Jesus tasted death, not just physical death. Because if he tasted physical death so that we wouldn't have to, then we'd, we'd, we'd look at that and we'd say, uh, people still die. People still die. That hasn't changed a thing. What it has changed is the death in terms of the separation from God. He tasted separation from God so that you and I wouldn't have to. That's what that means. And then the next word I want to spend a little bit of time talking about is this word sanctification. Sanctification. Aren't you glad you came to church to learn about sanctification today? Sanctification is an English word that comes from a Greek word that just really means to be made holy. Holy. And then, you know, there's a lot of confusion about holiness. Right? Holiness. Sometimes associated with clothing style. Sometimes associated with makeup or not, uh, hairstyle, uh, make, uh, movies or not. And there, there, there's a lot of confusion about holiness. And, but the word holy just means to be set apart. Set apart from things that are profane or ordinary. How many of you ladies have uh, special china that you've set apart for special occasions? Or maybe you have Christmas plates that you only get out at Christmas time. I know Terry had some Christmas plates out. I ate on holy plates uh, recently at home because they're holly and red and green and, and they, they only come out at certain times. They're, they're, they're special. And holy is special, but it's more than special. Set apart for God. And did you know that you are holy? If you're a follower of Christ, you are holy. God has set you apart for Himself. God has set you apart from everything that is unholy, impure, and unrighteous. And that's what the word sanctification means. Now, look at verse, uh, verses 11 through 13. For both he who sanctifies, those are Jesus, that's Jesus, and those who are sanctified, those are followers of Christ. So there's a sanctifier, and then those who are sanctified are all from one Father. For which reason he, Jesus, is not ashamed to call them brethren. Family, Jesus is not ashamed to call us his family. What? Now, that's right. That's an amen from a 15-month-old. Here we go. That's right. He's not ashamed. And you know what probably went through your mind when I said that? Your latest failure. How could I? Someone like me with what I've done. It doesn't mean to be made sinless. It means that we're set apart. Set apart for God. Those plates might have some chips in them, a few cracks in them. Nevertheless, they are still set apart. 
set apart. Not for just once a year, twice a year, you know, like Christmas and Easter, but, you know, set apart daily, set apart for God and realizing uh, what, what, it, what it means is, is that I belong to God. I don't belong to this world. I don't belong to my sin, even though my sin is a part at times of the reality of my life. I belong to God. I've been set apart from Him. And look at what it says. I will proclaim your name to my brethren in the midst of the congregation. I will sing your praise, and I will put my trust in Him. And behold, I and the children God has given me. Jesus is the sanctifier, the one who makes holy, and those who follow Him uh, are being made holy. We're in the process of being made holy. Then there's this word similarity, verse 14, really the, just part of that verse. Therefore, since the children, talking about humanity, shares in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same. So it's circling back to the humanity of Jesus. Circling back to the reality that Jesus is fully God and fully man and that he has um, lived life as we have lived it, as we live it. He is Emmanuel, God with us, God in our midst. God is one of us, Jesus, fully God and fully man. And then the next word is the word success, verses 14b through 16. That through death, through death, that is his death, the suffering of his death, Jesus, he might render powerless him who had the power of death. So Jesus accomplished something very successful in this, and, he, and he, that he would render powerless uh, the one who had the power of death. And you know who that was? It was the devil. And he might free those who fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. For assuredly, he does not give help to angels, but he gives help to the descendants of Abraham, that is, human beings. So look at this. He has rendered powerless the one who had, past tense, the power of death. In Revelation 1.18, uh, Jesus proclaims, I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I'm alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death in Hades. I now hold those keys in my hand. The devil used to hold those keys, and people uh, have been afraid of death. Now, I've just noticed something in life as, as a pastor and counselor. You know, uh, there, there are people who've been afraid of death that really don't need to be, and there are people that should be afraid of death that don't seem to be. And that somebody who is not a Christ follower, that is not afraid of death, is deceived. Is deceived. Because there's an eternity apart from God to be had. And that, that, that ought to scare the living daylights out of us. Now, if you've been around here for any length of time, you, you know I am not a fire and brimstone kind of guy, you know, uh, and, and, and I don't want to scare the hell out of you. Uh, although if it worked. Uh, but but listen, listen to what writers of documents of people that hung around with Jesus. Jesus uh, believed that hell was real. Read the Gospels. And I think he would know because he's the one that came from heaven, died, tasted death, knows what it's like, and has come back alive and given validation to everything that he said. But he now holds the keys of death. That means as a Christ follower, I don't have to fear death. I don't have to wonder. I don't have to wait and see. I don't have to wait and find out after I die where I'm going to spend eternity. Wouldn't that be, wouldn't that be horrible? Like, I'm dead, and then, you know, whatever it looks like, I wake up. And, oops, Jeff, you missed out. Sorry. We don't have to wait and find out. 
John, one of the guys that spent three years with Jesus, wrote in 1 John. Read it. I encourage you to read the Gospel of John. Read 1 John. It's towards the end of our New Testament documents. 1 John, and he wrote, These things have I written unto you that believe in the, in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. That you may know that you may have, that you have eternal life. You don't have to wait. We don't have to be afraid of death. We don't have to be afraid. When I was floating in the water back in May, and I was thinking, this could be it. I'm going to, I could go under, take that last big gulp. I remember thinking, I've heard that drowning is painless, but how would anybody know? You know, I, I don't know. I mean, I just, it's just funny the thoughts that go through your mind at a time like that. And then I thought, boy, then I'll, I'll see Jesus. I'll, Jesus, I'll see you face to face. You know, it'll just be that quick because the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And I thought, oh, I'll see Jesus face to face. My wife is the one that'll be sorry, but then she'll get the insurance check and rejoice. But anyway, I'm still worth more alive than I am dead, so... And then I remember thinking, but this is not that day. I mean, it's just that just that just hit me. I can't claim that was from the Lord, but it turned out to be true. But I was thinking, yeah, I could breathe my last, and I'm gonna. And, and, and it's because it's because there was a day in April of 1976 that I prayed and invited Christ into my life, and I gave my life to Him. And the proof of that has been the last 40 years. If I prayed that prayer and there had been no proof that followed that prayer would have been meaningless and empty and vain and false. It's not praying a prayer. It's opening our hearts to the reality of God where the presence of God invades our life and begins to change us and begins to sanctify us and make us holy. And I love what Charles Swindell said years ago. A Christian, a Christ follower is not someone who becomes sinless. They just start sinning less. And that's true. Because our desires change. Our desires in that, in that holiness is to please God and to live a life that makes a difference in this world. And Jesus has been so successful and uh, we no longer have to fear death. And then the next word is the word sacrifice. Verse 17. Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren and all things. There, it circles back to that. He had to be made like us. Jesus had to be made like us in all things so that he could become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. That means Jesus paid the price, paid the penalty for our sins. That's why we don't have to fear death. Because Jesus paid it all. He was that, that word propitiation. Just think of it as the payment, the covering for our sins, for the sins of people. And that becomes uh, retroactive into our lives when we trust in Him. Jesus was born as a man in order to die as a man for the sins of all men. And through His sacrifice, He reconciles uh, the believer to God. He bridges the gap between the two because He is the sum total of of both. And that's what a priest is. A priest is a mediator between two people. In a sense, a marriage counselor is a priest between two estranged people. And we don't think of him as a priest, but he is a mediator trying to bring the two together into one. And Jesus is that priest that brings God and man together. And who better to do it than the God and man who was combined into one body who suffered and died in our place to make propitiation for the sins of the people. So look at this. He's a merciful and faithful high priest. Merciful. We like mercy. <laughs> oh man, do we like mercy. Grace has been described as God giving us what we don't deserve, and mercy is Him withholding from us what we do deserve. And He's merciful. But look at verse 18, our last S word, our last word for today. Sympathy. Sympathy. 
Some of you thought there's no way he's going to cover an entire chapter in Hebrews in one uh, message and be done before 12 o'clock. You naysayers, I'm just saying. (laughs) Sympathy, verse 18, for since he himself was tempted, look at this, he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able, now he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. Do you know who those are? Them's you and me. We all experience temptation. And Jesus is able to come to our aid. He wants to. He's making himself available to us. As a sponsor in recovery, I make myself available to people in their time of temptation. I got one such text last night. Help me in my time of temptation. Those weren't his words, but that was the essence of it. Some of you know what that's like. But that's what Jesus is to each one of us. We have his number. It's 1-800-JESUS. Calling upon the name of the Lord. Calling out to him. He's merciful and faithful. I love this. And two chapters later in Hebrews chapter 4, it says this. For... We do not have a high priest who is unable. There's a couple of double negatives here, so I'm going to reword it in just a moment, but let me read it to you in the text. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. You cannot name a temptation that you've experienced, or will experience, that Jesus has not experienced. He's been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. So it goes on and says, Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we can receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Now I think Jesus helps us in temptation in two ways. First of all, if we call out to him, he's going to help us. Avoid the temptation. Avoid the sin. Temptation is inevitable. Sin is not. Temptation is not sin. Jesus was tempted and yet he never sinned. So it's not sinful to be tempted. You don't have to confess when you're tempted. We have to confess or should confess when what? When we've given in to the temptation. And so he'll help us on the front side of it, but how does he help us on the back side of it? When we've given in, John wrote, if we confess our sins, he's, Jesus is faithful to forgive us. So we don't have to wallow in shame and guilt. He helps us. He's merciful. that We can find grace to help us in our time of need. He has complete understanding. If we had more time, we would delve into 1 Corinthians 10, 13. I love this verse when it speaks about temptation. It says that no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to man. In other words, there's no unique temptation just to you. Nobody understands. Nobody knows what I go through. nobody, Nobody else. Well, First of all, Jesus does. And secondly, Paul wrote to us and said, all of our temptations are virtually the same. We all experience the same. Uh, We're not alone in them. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you are tempted, He will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. So He promises a way of escape. I promised you I would reword uh, Hebrews 4, so let me reword that um, and not leave you hanging. We have a high priest in Jesus who is able to empathize with our weaknesses. For it is true, for he was tempted in every way as we are, yet he never gave in to temptation and sinned. Even though that is true, we are able to confidently come to him and find the mercy and grace that we need. The humanity of Jesus. Emmanuel, God coming in our midst. That baby born, laid, lied, lay in the manger. Which is it, lie or lay? Anyway, um, placed in the manger. (laughs) 
so much, that great salvation and all that it entails that we've just kind of skimmed the surface of today. This great, great, great salvation. Let's not drift away. Let's let that be an anchor that keeps us um, in place and let's not neglect it. So maybe salvation is something that uh, you've neglected in life. I don't know. Maybe it's something you've put off. Maybe it's something that you've said, well, someday, someday, someday I'll give my life to Christ. Um, today could be that day. Today is someday. It is someday, isn't it? It's always someday. Today is the day. Today, today could be that day. And if you found in your heart you've been drifting away, I mean, you know in your heart you're a, you're a follower of Christ, but, you know, life happens. Life gets busy. You know, how, you know how it happens. Life happens. And then maybe not necessarily, you know, all bad or evil kinds of things. It could just be things. Just things. Things. Or sin could have been knocking at your door and, and, and you've been uh, opening the door to that. And it's causing you to drift. And there's a riptide that's cur carrying you out deeper and deeper uh, into waters that you don't want to go. Don't neglect. Don't neglect this great salvation. God is here for you. What more can I say? What more can he do? Let's pray.